Listen, honey, listen, honey. Listen, honey. Hey, everybody. I'm Jeannie Mai, and welcome to my podcast. I decided to have a podcast because, well, to be honest with you, it all started when I was at a VIP party at a Golden Globes after party. I was sitting in a circle of really cool people, two who were Golden Globe winning actresses. One was a neuroscientist that was a guest of one of the actresses, and the other was a billion dollar investor. And we just had this fabulous conversation about their jobs, why we're into the industry, why we're not into the industry. And I learned so much at the end of that night that it actually made me realize I have an incredible access to cool people just because of who I am, whether I'm invited to the VIP party or because I'm just super inquisitive. So I decided to have a podcast so that I could share the conversations with interesting people I love with people that are my fam, my fans out there. So listen, honey, it's a place where you can stop let your hair down and relax and be able to just learn and laugh with amazing, insightful people that I get to meet on my everyday walk. Welcome. Stony Island Audio. Oh my goodness. We are back, y'all. My name is Open Mike Eagle, and this is What It Happened Was. This is season two, episode one of What It Happened Was. I'm your host, Open Mike Eagle, and I am just... Happy to be here. I feel super fortunate coming off of a successful season one in which we did a deep dive on the career of the legendary Prince Paul, discussing all of his efforts from De La Soul to Chris Rock to Grave Diggers to Handsome Boy Modeling School and everything in between. Um, And now into this season where we sit down with LP of Company Flow, Definitive Jux, Run the Jewels fame. And we do a deep dive on his career, giving him a chance to tell his own story. Um, Like I said, I'm happy to be here. I'm super fans of both of these people, um, both of them influencing my work and my journey. And, um, you know, I'm lucky to be in this seat, being able to ask some questions and for them to come on this platform and use it as an opportunity to tell their own stories. That's what this show is about. That's what my podcast network, Stony Island Audio, is all about. Um... We have a bunch of shows on Stony Island Audio, uh, a lot of them centering around people inside of hip hop using podcasting as a platform to tell their own stories. And before we get into the episode, I want to try to uh, shine a light on one of our podcasts. This one is the Dad Bod Rap Pod. If you're a fan of season one of what it happened was and you're interested in, in um, the subject of this season... Uh, you very well may find some enjoyment in Dad by Rap Pod. And rather than me try to tell their story, here's a here's a snippet of the hosts telling the story themselves. I'm Damone Carter. I'm Nate LeBlanc. I'm David Moss. Hey, Stony Island, we are the Dad Bod Rap Pod. Three men of a certain age that get together every week to argue about rap shit. You know, I feel like I've been approaching a Stony Island basically my whole life, and we're very happy to be part of this new venture. Um, what you can expect from us is a kind of chat and interview show on hip-hop new and old. We feature exclusive evergreen interviews with cats like the Last Poets, Arm and Hammer, Atmosphere, Easy Mo B, and other luminaries. And this is what you can expect from the Dad Bod Rap Pod. New episodes every Thursday. Really happy to be a part of the Stony Island Network. If you like hip hop, you will enjoy our program. We are the Dad Bod Rap Pod. So that's the Dad Bod Rap Pod. You can check their show out every Thursday wherever you listen to podcasts. And um, we're about to get into it, y'all talking to LP and a quick note before that happens is I um, want to just give y'all a little insight, a little background of what it's been like doing this season. Uh, when we did the first season with Prince Paul, we were fortunate enough that the world was relatively as normal as we remember it. And uh, we got to do a lot of that taping. In fact, we got to do all of that taping in person. We did half of the recording sessions here in LA and we did the other half in New York. This time around, clearly, since we recorded uh, most of this um, in the last four to five months, things have been very different. So all of these episodes, all of these interviews have been recorded remotely. And in that, 
we've had quite the journey with technology, y'all. Um, this first episode, and I believe the first two were recorded on this little known uh, upstart, um, obscure software. Uh, I think it's called I think it's called Zoom. Zoom is is what the producers tell me. Uh, it's called. I'm sure you none of you all have any experience with that, but we recorded on Zoom and we learned that the audio quality of Zoom after the fact is not the greatest. It's certainly not as good as as it would be if me and LP were sitting in the same room. Um, it's good. It's serviceable. It'll do. And, you know, these first couple of interviews were laced with so many jewels that um, I didn't want to try to recreate it. So um, we're going to present these first couple of episodes uh, and the quality they were recorded in. And, um, you know, you're, you're going to hear over the course of this season us kind of figuring out the, the best balance in terms of sound uh, recording remotely and, and, and trying a few different platforms to make that happen. If the platform that we landed on decides to give us money, I might shout them out by name. But until that happens, I'm just giving you all a note that the sound in this season is a little bit of a journey. Speaking of giving us money, we want to shout out the people at ExpressVPN. We are so happy. We're so grateful that they have chosen to sponsor this show. As you know, I watch a fair amount of anime um, and all sorts of television, and I don't like being restricted by what a Netflix or an Amazon or a Hulu tells me is available in my region. I've done some TV business, and, and I know that these companies make different deals with different regions. So there's shows that are available on these platforms that you can't watch if your computer thinks you're in America. ExpressVPN lets you change your location so you can trick these websites into thinking you're different places. And it's really easy. All you have to do is open an app, select a region, tap one button to connect and refresh the page to access thousands of new shows and movies that were previously unavailable to you. You can choose from almost 100 different countries. You can watch Studio Ghibli movies on UK Netflix. You can watch different anime than what is available here in the U.S. on Japanese Netflix. You can watch Doctor Who on UK Netflix. You can watch It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia on UK Netflix. You can watch Steven Universe. On so, okay, I go on a UK Netflix one a lot. I haven't really gotten around to a lot of the other countries yet, but I have at least 99 other regions to explore and aside from being the graceful sponsors of this show, another reason to choose ExpressVPN is that you can stream in HD with no problem, no buffering, no lag, and it's compatible with all your devices. I like to start watching stuff on TV, and then I'll start watching it on my iPad, and then I'll start watching it on my laptop, and then I'll be in the bed watching it on my phone. And with ExpressVPN, you can use it on all of these different devices so you can pick up and your watch experience moves with you seamlessly. And not only does it change your location, it encrypts your data. So nobody can spy on what you're doing. So exclusively for listeners of what had happened was ExpressVPN is offering you three free months of service. That's three free months of ExpressVPN. Just go to expressvpn.com slash what? Expressvpn.com slash what to get three months of ExpressVPN for free. So shout out to ExpressVPN. Shout out to you for checking this out. Shout out to LP for coming on this program and telling his story. Well, here we go. Episode one. What it happened with it. You guys get some snacks for help. Oh my god. Oh yeah. Deluxe labor, the underground undertaker. The whole cape is independent as fuck flavor. Audio exhibit, visit the history. To him winning without fucking with the industry. And him losing without fucking with the industry. No illusion, we tracing every move in the symphony. 
This is official from lifting of pencils Cold flow the depth jugs up to the fist and the pistol I'm sending questions like infinite missiles Digging for details when stories from the past come up And if he don't remember then he has to shrug It's what the podcast does, what it happened was Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm, I'm very excited to kick off this, this new session, this new season of what had happened was with a, with a guest I'm very excited to be uh, speaking to and doing deep dives on on his uh, amazing career. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome uh, Mr. L. Producto himself, LP. What's up, sir? What's up, man? Thanks for having me. Of course, of course. I, I'm, I'm excited. Yeah. To have you and and honored that you're uh, willing to talk to me and let the people hear stories behind um, yeah. so much awesome stuff that you've made. If, if, if I can remember them, you know what? what I mean. Like you know, years of drug abuse. You know, uh, you know, uh, you know, running from my running from my past. You know, I hear like you. Man. I could, you know, I, I'll try. <laughs> no, I hear you, man. It's it's funny because as as fun as me and Paul's sessions were. Um, I could tell that after a while they were starting to feel like therapy for him. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? In, 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 in good ways right. and in, in challenging ways. So it's like, you know, right, you, right, you right. do, especially like for artists like you and artists like him who have done so much, like part of the way you're even able to do that is you don't fucking dwell on the past a lot. You know what I'm saying? You're always moving on to the next thing. So, you know, sitting yeah. and thinking and talking, you know, can, yeah. can, be, can be deep. It's interesting. I have a theory about that. It's one that I've developed recently over the years because I always had a terrible memory. Like I never, you know, people, people would be like, you don't remember when we went to Japan together? And I'd be like, <laughs> you know, like, 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 you know, shit that like most people. That's would be, big shit. That was big. You know what I mean? Like, you don't remember this dude burst in a fire and, and you put him out with a blanket. You know, it's like, I'm just like, I, I'm sorry. I vaguely, you were there, you know, like, I don't, <laughs> you know, and, and I always wondered about that, you know, because I always, I always like imagine that maybe someday I might like sit down and try and write a novel, you know, right. or write, write, right. write something about my life, maybe. Although I find my life the, like the least attractive thing to possibly write about. But like it, but, but in thinking about doing that, I, I've sort of been like, you know, I don't think I have the type of memory for detail. Right. Right. That 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 like a real author or a real writer in that format mm-hmm. would, and it's kind of made me confront shit because I'm like, why don't I have a memory? And I, <laughs> and I kind of, I kind of started to realize that um, and I'm speaking to a couple other people who I know who maybe have a similar childhood as I did. Yeah. That w- when your childhood is tough, yeah, a little tough. When all you do is you just are waiting for the next thing. The next because terrible the, thing. Because, because not even the next terrible thing, but you spend your entire childhood and, and, and growing up looking for the future. Like, mm-hmm. when do I get, when do I get my future? Because my present is really fucking hard. And uh-huh. when do I get to the part where I'm in control, where I'm, where I have agency? Where do I get to the part where, and I, and it applies to me as a musician for sure, because I've never stuck myself in one place. I've right. never, sat back and really done what we're doing right now not much anyway i did a little bit around the release of the records and but you know i just think that when you don't when you train yourself to shut out your history Hmm. and to not deal with it a bit and to run forward and 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 to go for greener pastures you know down the line that you don't you have you don't really flex that part of your brain that is necessary to to conjure too many details about about what your life was i couldn't tell you what year anything happened (laughs) <laughs> for the most part you know i can give general yeah. <laughs> I can give like, but anyway it's just interesting you know i think that there's some people who you ask them like they remember fifth grade you know right. and i'm right. like i don't i don't remember my childhood right. Right. I, yeah so well, but you know I, I do think our first episode here uh for the folks listening at home is is about an album that's near and dear uh to my heart company flows debut lp fun crusher plus and I think it would do us a disservice to just dive right into that. I think we have to like um, 
walk a little bit through your your journey with hip hop. Like, because you were young making all of that stuff, but um, everybody's entrance into hip hop is different. And you were in New York at a time when, like, you know, the underground was was having like this this epic revolution. I ended up feeling it all the way in Chicago. Um, sure. And I'm I'm really uh, interested to hear how you engaged that. Like, how did like how did you um, how did you take that journey to start rhyming and start making beats? You know, I I think I did it the way I, a lot of like kids did it, which was just being a, a a kid and being a fan of like my DMC, mm-hmm. you know. And that whole era of music and just being in New York, you know, right. just being in, 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 in Brooklyn and in New York City. And, um, you know, I moved to Brooklyn when I was six from Manhattan. And my parents got divorced and I moved to Brooklyn. And then um, it was a kind of a magical time for sure. You know, the, the cliches are, are real. They're real. You know, like they were. They were like, you know, tra- taking the train, you were taking the train that was covered in fucking Anna and Burner. You know, um, take you know, um, there were people break dancing on the street on cardboard. There were people walking around with giant boom boxes with record players in them. Like straight up. <laughs> that doesn't like, sound like how does that even work? You know, I still to this day haven't gotten <laughs> one of those. Like I was like, Mom, I want one of those. She was like, Shut the fuck up. Take this bootleg Voltron toy. Um but <laughs> So, you know, just being a kid and just loving it. And, so did you, and, but did you I, always rhyme as a kid? Like, did, did you grow up I, rhyming? I, I guess so. I mean, I wrote my first rhyme on a piece of paper that I still have framed oh, on that's a piece tight. of construction. My mother framed it for me. Uh, years ago, she, she surprised me with it years ago. <sighs> and she, that she had framed the first rap that I ever wrote. I think it was 10. Damn. And, you know, I'm Jam J, the impossible child. When I tell my tale, all the girls are beguiled. I, I'm pretty <laughs> proud that I use that word at the time. That's tight. I still, I still wouldn't use that word now. I don't all yeah, the way yeah, know no. what it means. So that's, you were pretty no. advanced. <laughs> but um, I was, it was just me. It was, it just started with me doing, just rhyming out loud. And then, and then, and then inserting my name into the rhyme. You know uh-huh, what I mean? Uh-huh. And then eventually just freestyling. And then eventually writing it down and, 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 you know, and just playing with it. And, I never took it really seriously as something I wanted to do, except I just thought it was the most awesome thing in the world. Right. I just thought that I just thought that it was my city. I was just like it was. I was right at that age where it was. I was the target audience for this. Like it just made me happy, and mm-hmm. um, you know, especially when Run DMC hit the scene, and it was like, oh, so you don't have to like dress in like a, a like a sequin, right? Like you know, like it's not, robe it's not and, disco, yeah. You know, uh, uh, it, you know, you don't have like those dudes look just cool, like regular New York dudes. Cool. Right. You know, like they just look like all they had to do is become adults. Right. <laughs> like, <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't have to become Ziggy Stardust. You know, right. like, they didn't have right. to become, you know, they didn't have to become, you know, Funkadelic. Right. They just they, they just had to become cool. And, they didn't um, have the big shoulder pads with the spikes and the and the mohawks and none of that. Which I'm not knocking. Games. Which I'm, of course. Which I'm not. But of course. It's less relatable. Right. You know, it, it, it doesn't make you, but you know, when you're looking at someone who looks like they're from another planet, it's very <laughs> hard to imagine, very hard to imagine getting from where you're at to there, you know? Right. Right. Uh, you know, looking at someone who's just taller than you and has on a jean jacket is like, you know, well, I could probably do that someday. Yeah, I can, I can and, wear uh, a jean jacket. Yeah. <laughs> and, and hence, you know, and hence I do. Um, and, you know, but I, but as I got a little older and I was obsessed with rap and I was up on everything that came out and I was listening to Mr. Magic and, you know, and, and I was listening to Red Alert and I was listening to, um, everything that I could get my hands on and there were tapes being traded and stuff. And, 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 um, and then I started, I had a boom box that had a, a like this story I share with, I think a lot of producers. I have a boom box that I had a dual cassette deck and a mic in it, an external mm-hmm. mic. Mm-hmm. And you, and I started making pause tapes. Mm-hmm. I started to figure out how to make pause tapes, which is the classic, you know, you, you, you know, you play it from one side and record it on the other side, and then you pause right before the downbeat, and then you right. rewind, then you let go, and then you pause again, and it takes about fucking an hour, <laughs> and then, you know, and, and then you have, like, you know, three minutes of, of a consistent loop. Right. I got really good at that. I got to the point where I started remixing songs, you know, oh. um, 
I started getting I started getting creative with it because I because reflexively I was so good at it, just the normal shit that I started to um play around with edits and play around with what I could do. Mm-hmm. Um <clears throat> and and that sort of made me want to start to rap over it you know what i mean and i was like well i got this and i got the little mic here too so now i can put that tape here every time you did it the sound degraded you know of what course. i mean so it's like you, you you recorded it here then you took what you recorded you put it back here and then you recorded it here again the, the the second time you did it it was it was with the mic right and um so i start i started doing that and um you know school ultimately ended up not working out for me but i had already started writing things i started making demos i already started writing by the time i was um this this is where we bump into the memory thing (laughs) but but by the time i was probably 12 13 i was trying to make jams okay you're trying um, to like make records yeah okay yeah like i was you know i didn't know i was terrible and i didn't know what what i was doing but i was trying Mm -hmm trying to figure out who I was, how do I, who am I, like, what is this, you know, like, yeah. and, 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 and trying to, um, and it was just for me, but by the time I got to probably about 13, I started to take it seriously. Mm. I started to be like, I want to get good at this, you know, I want to, I, and, and, um, and that's when I, I have borrowed a, a friend of mine had this little, uh, Casio SK one, mm-hmm. which was, a, which was the first sort of, sampler that was available to the public that wasn't thousands of dollars but it was for children so right. it was just like it was like it was this big it had 20 keys you know and it was very thin and it was like it had like two seconds of sampling time on it so you you you, you had to sample the record at 45 so yeah. that you could record Slow it, it at, yeah. and it was and it was played in scale so the lower you got this the, the the higher it was the faster and and the and then the lower you got on the keyboard you slow it. I so see. you play it on 45, you sample it and it, and it samples at the key up here. And then you go all the way down the keyboard and then you get the slower loop. You know what I mean? The longer, the longer loop. You had to extend. So I was already trying to figure out tricks as to how to make this thing work. Right. And then you can, instead of doing a pause tape, it was a finger thing. Then uh-huh. I'm playing, now I'm playing beats like this. And then I got a four track, bought some used, Tascam yeah, four yeah. track or whatever, and and th- and now I'm playing the beat all the way through, and then I'm sampling other things, and I'm playing them in, wow, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> you know whatever, <laughs> like yeah, yeah. And um, so by the time I was like a freshman, I was I was pretty much trying to make jams, and um, by the time I was a sophomore, I was out of the system. I had been kicked <laughs> out of school, you know, I had been kicked out of school, and um, I was officially officially trying to be a rapper. It's interesting to hear you talk about the spe- like the, the stuff that really entranced you about hip hop, because um, your style for the longest has been so like complex, and mm. so when you dedicated yourself to getting good, like who who were you looking at as like really dope at that time that pushed you to kind of like you didn't want to do like regular A B patterns like who, what made you want to like go more complex with like the, the structures of what you were writing? Well, first of all, I mean, I think I did do regular AD patterns for a long time. Mm-hmm. You know, like the first, sure. you know, I've got, I've got probably years and years of demo tapes rotting in storage that no one will ever hear <laughs> because release the, the day, tapes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I can't even subject myself to those things. For sure. uh, back, back in the day, you know, um, Back when I was a kid, uh, you know, you didn't. Everyone didn't hear your worst song. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like you heard the best song. You know, like, right. and, and so you know. Um, but I, do, I don't think that I consciously necessarily made that choice. But mm-hmm. I think really, all the way up into Company Flow, I was a pretty traditional sort of style. I had a pretty traditional New York style, um, and I was still trying to land that. You know what I mean? I was still trying to kind of get into that, but something about um, something about the chemistry between me and Just, yeah, we started to, you know, and 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 something about um, there was there was no necessarily there was no one that I was necessarily thinking, oh, I've got to I've got to change my style for that. You know, I was like, I want to be Big Daddy Kane, I want to be Cool G Rap, I want to be EPMD. You know what I mean? I, um, 
I would have been happy, you know. Um, but 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 you know, and to me in my mind, I always was making those records. But I'm weird, so this shit just came out. <laughs> so know through, what I mean? through your through the lens of your creativity, it comes out this way. Exactly, and it's like, hey, what do you think? It sounds like EPMD, right? And they're like, no, <laughs> <laughs> like, nope, yeah, and like. And I'm like, well, I mean, you know, obviously the influence is there. And they're just like, mm. you know, like, I, you know, eventually there's a, there was a creative explosion. Right. And um, I mean, and look, the, the, the stakes were higher in the early 90s. They had become higher. Right. Like, um, I mean, shit, even if you wanted to go even just to De La, or if you even wanted to go to Cool G Rap, or if you wanted to go to like... There, there was already there, there were already crazy strides being made in terms of what you could do on a right. record as a, as a lyricist that had a, that that I was right there following and yeah. and being you know there was a time there was a, a period of time in growing up where the records that we were all waiting for you know like like you just like you knew a new rap record was that. it didn't matter what the fuck rap record it was that's how rare it was right. that it had made it to a label gotten funding been recorded and is now in whatever store that you can go to that you can get your mom to let you go and maybe buy some. So you were right there along growing with at the same time, the art, you know? Right. So every time you thought that you kind of had something figured out, someone would come out and do something that had never been done in mm -hmm. hip hop before. And that was a magical time to exist. I think that that's plateaued over the years and then right. it's ramped up again and then it's mm -hmm. plateaued again. Mm -hmm. But there was a period of time of about maybe 15 years where, it was just an all out, like everyone was inspired. Everybody and so was that, pushing that, everybody else. Everyone was pushing, you know, everyone was, I mean, you know, then you had motherfuckers like organized confusion of drop course. on the scene and you're just like, oh, wake up, wake up, rise up to the uh, words of organized, visualize the man in the logo, so uh, was the madness trapped into the mind of the foul. Uh, Vote ghouls are going long distance. Oh, okay. Like, oh, it's on. Like, right. You can do, like, oh, you're allowed to do that shit? Like, okay. Like, yeah. Like, and I get, and I feel like we, you know, we hit that sweet spot right where we were confident in the fact that we could make some jams and confident in something, but also we really were let loose in our minds in terms of reaching, you know, in terms of being like, you know what? Like, like the sinister grin, like, I want to do something fucked up, you know? Yeah, like, yeah. I actually, I actually want to destroy it all, right. not destroy the the culture, but I want to destroy what I think that everyone knows about it right. and, and come in and I want people to, you know, look, I also come from a scene where cats were, you know, it's not the battle scene in, exactly, but it used to be that dudes knew that I rap, they'd bring their friend over who would rap and you'd have to battle each other right. in your apartment. You right. know what I mean? Like right. it wasn't, it wasn't like a televised thing with two dudes like yelling in each other's faces. It right. was like the beats were going and cats were smoking and like, you know, and, and, and it was just, it, it was just seeing who was going to get it the hardest at that, at that moment. Yeah. Yeah. And you, and you know, so you carry that into some shit where you're like, I, I want to do something that, that's going to shut the room down. Right. I want to do something that's going to be like, a, it's going to elicit a couple of reactions. Either A, what the fuck was that? <laughs> B, I can't do that, <laughs> you know, because I'm not even there in my head. And C, you know, um, that shit is fucking ill. Yeah, that shit yeah, is yeah. ill. Because it doesn't matter if you're doing some shit that no one gets and or likes and is different. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> it's like, you know, it's like, congrats. You, know, you, 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 did, you did something that's, too weird for anyone to like and so you know and and it's about you know knowing um where to diverge is about is about knowing where to plant your foot in tradition you know mm. the, it, like the the difference or what you're doing will only be appreciated and recognized if if you're doing it in the context of something that you are acknowledging you exactly. know like i'm acknowledging that i'm here in these lines and i'm gonna fucking poke my hand up above that line but I'm still here in these lines. So right. when I do that, it's, you're going to, you know, hopefully you're going to recognize it and feel it because I'm not just abandoning what you love about it. Right. You know? Right. Cause you I'm do hopefully... care about it. It's, you're not doing it. Like you said, you don't want to destroy the institution no. or destroy the context, but you do want to subvert it at that. particular times. I wanted to subvert what, what the rules were for myself within it. Right. I wanted to subvert or, or, or I wanted to be free. Mm -hmm to play i wanted to be free to play 
there have been so many people that I had looked up to that I learned from that I based everything I know on and everything I could do on. But I wanted something that was my own. And it wasn't some sort of like contrived thing. Like I'm going to come up with something weird. It was like, I'm just going to let myself kind of do, do the weird shit that does actually occur to me, you know? And, um, and when you find a group of people who are, are into that, you know, when you find a group of friends who are like, yeah, do that. That's ill. It, it, it helps. So I, I blossom in that, you know, in that context. Like, you know, having like Just and Len around and they were, they had, they were on the same shit, man. Cats were really traditionalists, you know, like really rooted in and, you know, really were there and loved everything about the music and every, knew how it got to where it got, mm-hmm. was there listening as it evolved, felt the the alchemical change of being evolved as they listened to it because they were experiencing that not as a retroactive thing but as a first time thing mm-hmm. and um but i had stumbled on just something that was fun for me mm-hmm. which is like i'm gonna i'm gonna drop your jaw here i'm gonna say eight things to your four you know right, right. like you know? so there's there's a lot said about the open mic scene in new york um, mm-hmm. around the time that I first started hearing the company float. Uh, so you would hear about New York and Poet Cafe. You would hear about yeah. Lyricist Lounge. Uh, I was there, buddy. Yeah, what was your relationship to those places? Man, New York, New York and Poet Cafe, probably more than Lyricist Lounge for me, although I did do Lyricist Lounge and we even did a couple of like kind of classic shows there. I mean, we did, we did a company flow and ultra mag show. Um, and it was a great venue. It was cool. Uh, but, but New York and Post Cafe felt a little bit more like an extension of the Stretch and Bobbito yeah, yeah. scene. And the Stretch and Bobbito scene, which emanated out all over its tentacles everywhere. And exactly. it really brought people from every borough and sometimes from every state. You know Absolutely. what I mean? But that, that, that was a special, and that, you know, when I think about it, that was one of those places that i when i think about that time in terms of like venues um when, when there were no deals yeah what you have to understand about that period of time is that while there was a creative explosion while everybody was the creative explosion came from everybody agreeing that they were not into what was happening in the major yeah. in the, in the yeah. mainstream wasn't like i don't want to be successful it was like eh, eh, you know like yeah. We're like everyone was into being an artist. Everyone was super into the culture of being that. Everyone like it was something that was giving a lot of kids direction and that that, that didn't and 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 I and rules, you know, things that, you know, a code that people that you know we search for a lot of latchkey kids, you know. Same same here, honestly. Like yeah. like I like to tell people all the time, like finding like the b boy arts. As a as a performing art, like that shit saved my life in so many ways because it like it gave me a way to like engage with other people and and some shit that I understood the rules to and like oh all I got to do is get tight okay word <laughs> you know what I'm saying and that's what it yeah. is yeah and there was such a um it's it's hard to describe to people if you weren't there but there yeah. was such a um such an overwhelming sense of like um generosity and community it wasn't competitive it wasn't combative it was like everyone was there and they wanted to see what the fuck you got and it was Mm -hmm. but it wasn't like show me what you got kid it was it it was like everyone was kind of at the same level everyone was explosively creative but there were no outlets there was no label system that right that put out the type of stuff that was happening yet um and there were you know at that time it was either like you get a deal and you do that thing or not. But the deal was like this mythical thing on a mountain right. that I think was so mythical and so unobtainable and also weird for so long. Like I'm going to make a, I'm going to, maybe I'll get a demo deal. You know, I'm going to give my tape to some intern at Jive records. You know, like right. it, it was so unobtainable that I think it turned back around on the community where everyone was like, fuck that shit. Mm-hmm. And out of that, fuck that shit. All of a sudden, everyone was hanging out at different spots, be it Washington Square Park, be it New York and Polo's Cafe. Um, if you were lucky, you got up on the stretch and bob. Right. And so, because everyone on, on Thursday night mm-hmm. from fucking 1 to 4 a.m. was listening to stretch and bob. 
And that to us was, you made it. Wow. You made it if you're on Stretch and Bob. And we listened and we just did that while we were making the company flow record. We would just listen every night. We'd get our fucking, we'd brush our teeth and sit there and just fucking listen. You know, hours upon hours upon hours. Hour, hour, hour. And now a word from our sponsors. We're going to get back into our talk with LP in just a moment, but I need to take a second to remind you of our sponsor that we're really grateful for, ExpressVPN. If you're like me and you like to watch lots of TV stuff on the apps and you don't like being told by said app what you can watch based on what deal they've made with the region you're in, you can use ExpressVPN to tell that app you are in another place. If you want to access Japanese content on the Japanese server, if you want to access all the different programs that are available on UK Netflix, for instance, you can use ExpressVPN to let your computer tell Netflix that you are not in the US. You're in the UK. You're in the UJ. No, you're just in Japan. There's a hundred regions that you can choose from. Only a few of them begin with you. And changing your location with ExpressVPN is really easy. Just open the app, select one of those 100 locations, tap one button to connect, and then you just refresh whatever app you're in. And, and suddenly you have access to all this programming that you previously were told wasn't even there. It's in the app already. They're just hiding it from you. So why choose ExpressVPN over other services? Well, one, they've been gracious enough to sponsor what had happened was. But aside from that, you can also use ExpressVPN to stream in HD with no buffering or lag. It's compatible with all of your devices, phone, laptop, tablet, TV. And not only does it change your location, it encrypts your data so no creepy spy creeps can creepy spy on what you're doing. So for listeners of what had happened was ExpressVPN is offering three months of service for free. Just go to ExpressVPN slash what? That's ExpressVPN slash what to get three free months of ExpressVPN. ExpressVPN slash what? And now back to your regularly scheduled program. I, wa- I want to hear something about, you know, as, as succinct as, 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 you know, you feel we could put it across. I, I want to like talk about or hear about putting a group together. Like what brought you Lynn and just together to make company flow? Well, company flow started just as me coming up with a name that was cooler than just me. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, you know, I've been growing up on record, you know, growing up on groups, you know, yeah. and, and I always thought a group was just so cool. I just thought it was run DMC, public enemy, right. EPMD. You know, I didn't want to just be like Jamie Moline, you know, I, like, <laughs> I, I, you know, but I didn't have, a, I didn't have a group. I just right. had an idea for a name, but I very, very soon, I got kicked out of high school. I went to musical engineering school. So I, at 16 years old, I went to musical engineering school. I'm going to just do this because it makes sense and sure. it helps understand how we got there. But I went to this place called Center for the Media Arts, which was in, Manhattan, which was right around the corner from FIT, doesn't exist anymore. But at the time, um, because my mother was like, you're not going to be the dude who gets kicked out of high school and just doesn't do shit. Right. So she was like, what do you want to do? She was very cool about it. I mean, I love her for this because, and I'll carry that with me wherever I go. If I ever have kids, I will carry that with me because she actually, for the first time, no one had ever asked me what I really wanted to do. Yeah. It wasn't a question you ask kids, you know? But after fuck up, after fuck up, you know, single parent household, and I'm getting kicked out of schools and running around, not doing what, 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 you know, what I'm supposed to do. She, and I finally, you know, she was like, what do you want to do? And I said the thing that every white mom wants to hear, which is, you know, I want to be a rapper (laughs) (laughs) and uh, I want to be a producer. I want to be a rapper. And she was like, well, we're going to find somewhere where you can get something somewhere with that but it's not going to be that you just sit around here and just right. and just and just work on it and i was like all right and then she, and then she found this school and and i was like it's engineering school it wasn't for people who wanted to be producers and rappers it was for people really who wanted to be engineers you right. know 
but it got you into the studio and right. it got you into with teachers and it got you into getting your hands on things equipment. that equipment uh, equipment and being in a professional environment and learning the ropes to some degree i learned pro tools i learned this is like but pro tools was like twenty thousand dollars and it was two tracks you know yeah, what i mean like, it, like yeah. it was like a giant yeah, outboard like, machine yeah yeah like you know like they damn near had like the you know like the the engineer smock on when they did that like <laughs> It was like a supercomputer. Um, but so I did that. And through that, I met, um, so I, I made friends with someone who was 24 years old. Mm -hmm. I was 16. I lied about my age to get into the place. I had taken my GED, I guess, at around 17. I took my GED, maybe. I don't know. Again, who knows? But I went to this place. I met my friend Lou from Hollis, Queens. Mm -hmm. And, and Lou was, um, he had at 24, which to me was ancient. Um, he was in engineering school. He was on an uptick because he had had a lot of drinking problems and a lot of things going on in his life that prior to me meeting him. And then when I met him, he was this calm, wonderful, nice guy from Hollis who got to know me. We shared a lot. He, we shared a lot of the same musical interests and I knew everything about rap and he was like, he started to see what I was doing and he was like, you know, probably the first person to be like, yo, you should get a fucking deal. Hmm. And I was like, oh, okay, how do you get a deal? <laughs> you know, how do you get a deal? He would bring me up to Hollis Queens and, um, and we would go do, um, demo. Some of them were done at like the, the studio of, uh, of the dude who was in the disco twins. Okay. I don't know if you know who the disco know, twins are. That. I didn't know either at the time. <laughs> But since then, I've, you know, I've, I was like, the Disco Twins, oh, yeah, 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 sure. But, but you know, the Disco Twins were, you know, a group from New York that kind of tried to pop off and, like, had a little record or something. The Twins are on the clock while I'm busting it up. And everybody at the party is doing the butt. And for those who bite, just get ready to fight. I destroy on sight, so kiss your ass goodnight. But he had a studio in, 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 in Hollis, Queens. We used to go there and do demos and shit. So... Long story short, I did get a little single deal with a friend of Lou's, and this dude was a dude by the name of Dan Johnson, who went under the name Antex okay. and had a rap record out on Tough City. So he had an album out. He had gotten a little, you know, success in in an indie way, I guess, you know. And him and another dude have decided that they were going to start an indie label. Here I am, like sixteen years old, and I'm like, and they were like, oh, we'll we'll give you a deal. So to me, it was like, oh, that's it. I'm a star. That's, what, I'm like, that's <laughs> what I've been waiting for. Thank you. That was actually pretty easy. <laughs> like, yeah. And, um, but I didn't have, and I, so I, so I, so I made this song. I made this song and, and I, and I didn't have anybody, um, but I was hanging out with those dudes and I was hanging out in Hollis and, you know, I was this fucking little asshole kid who was in over his head and like trying to be cool and shit. But, you know, I, I wasn't that cool. I don't think, you know, I was a good guy, but I wasn't, I wasn't cool. Um, not, not in the way that these 24 year old dudes were in my mind, they were just like, holy shit. I didn't understand any, they, they, they knew how to make, you know, they knew equipment. They knew, they knew how they were in the industry. It was right. like, and we started a studio together. Um, Cause I had a sampler and a, and a room and, <laughs> and, um, right after I had like made this song and written this song and I didn't have the hook yet. And, um, and for my 18th birthday, it was already done. It was already ready to go. And I put it out right as I turned, it was done when it was written when I was 17 and I put it out right when I turned 18 and I met Mr. Land at a, I had a birthday party. At you had, house. it was your birthday party. My birthday party okay. at my at, at the loft that I lived in. That was my mother's spot. Okay, that she my mother had a spot that she had um built like about like a dozen rooms in. Okay, and she this is pre Airbnb. All right, she had built like you know we, it was like we had this this great spot. It was this loft, and I was like, this is amazing. And she was like, yeah, it is. I'm gonna fill it with twelve people. And I'm going to build because I don't have any fucking money coming in. <laughs> so I'm going to build mad rooms in this oh, bitch. And I'm going to get students. So it was that's like. That's such an excellent a, hustle. Moms was on it. She was on it. And, and it was a flop house, basically. It was yeah. like, 
you know, and, and it was just mayhem. But it was, you know, students and blah, blah, blah. And anybody who wanted like a cheap room, yeah. she would fill it. And we, and I had a room there. And then, and then, um, and I had built a little studio out of a closet, mm-hmm. literally in there. And, um, long story short, I keep saying that because it's never going to be short. <laughs> but, but, uh, so we threw a little party at that spot. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Do a little party. I'm turning 18, and through um, Lou and Darren, uh, who I now knew, um, uh, they were like, "Oh, we'll have our boy Lenny. Lenny's been working with us on some shit. We'll have him DJ the party." And so Len comes. Me and Len are the exact same age. Okay. This is the first dude that I've met out of this crew that's my age. I like him immediately. <laughs> we like each other immediately. Yeah. He's he's he's. He, I see that he's got some chops. Yeah. He's he's on the turntables. We got twelve hundreds in the living room. He's he's blending shit, and I'm and I'm like fucking. I'm freestyling over there, and, nice. and you know we're doing what you do at a party, you know. Yeah. And after that, I was like, I just kept in touch with him. I was like, I, we we just like each other. We vibe. We had the same influences. Like I said, we're the same age, mm-hmm. so. I asked him if he wanted to be down. I was like, look, I got this thing called company flow. It's just me. <laughs> but, you know, I, I, you know, you, I need a DJ. Because Run DMC had a DJ. So right. I probably need a DJ. <laughs> it's a good call. You know, so from then on, it was like, cool. He gave me the hook for that record. And then that was company flow. Okay. Now, we met just through the same people. So when these guys started to get their label off the ground and they started to actually try, like one of them was Gamaya was going to be one artist. They had another dude named Lamel who was from Hollis Queens, who was like one of the dudes that like LL Cool J, the legend was that LL Cool J like kind of ripped him off. Like okay. it was just some okay. weird shit. <laughs> good, good dudes, you know, good, good dude. Um, they started trying to do the independent label hustle. They were doing independent promotions. They were like, this is back in the day when people were like, they'd be a promotional team. So they'd be faxing shit all day long. Yeah, street teaming and all that type of shit. It was more like radio promotion. It was more like we're we're creating one sheets about artists and we're faxing it. Gotcha. So someone at some radio station is looking at the office and there's a fax coming out. (laughs) (laughs) Like, rappy rap J, you know? And it's like, it's, it's it's my it's these dudes making the facts. Just was down with them. Just okay. was childhood friends. Just was childhood friends with them. And so Just had been out of town on some miscreant adventure, and and he had come back into town. Um, and I, and so he got introduced into the crew. And I liked Just, and me, and Just was really into what I was doing. And he um, ended up, I, you know, a room in my in that in that fucking flop house ended up coming free. And um, some student or someone went away and I was like, yo, and he needed a spot. And I was like, yo, why don't you post up here and we'll, fuck it, we'll just make music. He had a sampler. He had like, you know, he had like, that I think he stole. Like, I think he used (laughs) to like, you know, he was like a, you know, relatively mischievous guy. And um, we ended up, you know, having this studio. So the music that I was making kind of after that first jam that I did under the name Company Flow, between the time of 1993 and 1996, it was really just me and Just and Len just sort of vibing out, coming over, and really me and Just just fucking writing and kind of trying to outdo each other on the lyrics. And I would make the beats, and we would just sit up all night and do and and do this shit, smoke weed, and and and, and do this. And didn't, you know, by the time we had looked up, it was it was originally going to be solo. We were going to put out some jams separately gotcha. one side was going to be company flow and that was going to be vital nerve the right. other side was going to be big just featuring lp which was going to be eight steps to perfection gotcha i made the music for both and and i i remember we were kind of prepping to do that and i was like you know why don't we just why don't you just be in company flow the right. cooler name <laughs> <You know? laughs> and we're making jams like right. we're making songs Y'all make together. Records, yeah yeah, it doesn't and mean it, that this is all can't... supposed to be out through your homie's record label originally. No, okay. no, no, no. That okay. went south. Gotcha. That went south. So, so, so that that whole thing went bad. It, like they, you know, I was just a kid, and they were like, I forget what happened, but we we bumped up against each other, and they were like, "You're shell. You're never gonna make another record again. Your That's career is so... over." And I was like, <laughs> "What the fuck? Like, I just <laughs> the deal, you know? I just, 
you just gave me the deal, and I thought that that meant that I was secure. And now you, and now you're telling me it's over. Like I just, I just, I didn't even finish high school, man. Like, you know, <laughs> so you know, I was wrecked. I was like, oh fuck. But you know, just was you know their their friend. You know, shit happens or whatever. And you know, it's, it's the past is the past, but just stuck by me because I think that we were really doing some, he was really interested in the music that we were making. And he knew that I was just a kid and he knew that I was, you know, just as 24 too, you know, he was a little older. Okay. Yeah. Just about eight years older than me. Yeah. You know, um, I think that's right. Yeah. If not, maybe a little more, but, but, um, so we just, you know, me and just basically posted up, he, he stuck around and we, and, 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 and we were posted up in the meantime during the day that we would go work at tower Records. Okay. And so we had both gotten the tower mail order department job, nice. which was on the, which was on the top of uh, Lafayette. And then, um, it was above tower books. So I don't know if you were ever in New York when tower records and tower books and shit was, I think I went by tower once in New York, but yeah, yeah. yeah. well, Here's how it worked. They put the dudes in the front with the computers, and those dudes had to wear shirts and slacks. Uh-huh. And those dudes were um, doing the entries and shit for what pe- credit card entries and shit for what people were ordering. Because gotcha. before the internet and before it was a thing, people would order from the Tower Records mail order catalog. I see. And in the back, where I was, was the work release dude. The dudes who couldn't get a job anywhere else or yeah. weren't qualified necessarily to do anything or didn't really want to try to do anything like me. And, <laughs> and those dudes were just fucking assholes and we were hot and smoking weed and pissing fucking around and we were in the back, but we were wrapping up the packages. We were the grunts. And so Just was in the front. I was in the back. And, you know, he had to wear the shirt and, I, I didn't, and it didn't even matter what I wore, you know? Right. And, like I said before, I'm probably personally responsible for selling, sending out 10,000 Bone Thugs and Harmony CDs. <laughs> At like literally like, <laughs> like during that period of time, we were taking the money that we made and we would go to the studio at night and we, and we would, you know, buy time. And, and so is this, the, and this is the music that became the original Fun Crusher? Yes. Okay. So what, what did that name come from, Fun Crusher? So there's a story for that. So the way that the name happened was r- just had written a rap down on a piece of paper. Mm-hmm. And he spit it to me, and, but I was like not paying attention or whatever. And then I, I like picked his pad up to like read what, what it said. And I, and I burst into like hysterical laughter because I thought that he wrote the word Fun Crusher down. Which I just thought, because like our whole thing was that we were obsessed with language. We were yeah, obsessed with like, yeah. how can you fucking, how can you make things that aren't supposed to make sense make people laugh? Right. And how can you make it and how or 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 make people sound feel like they've been insulted? <laughs> and, and, and you know what I mean? Or just or just fuck with language in yeah. a way that just didn't. That was our kick, you know. Um, it, 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 you know the shit that like was. That you know, uh, English is a really dope language because you it's modular and you can fucking change it and move it around and 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 you can create new shit as you know. And so I read this shit and I I just read the word it said the ill fun crusher <laughs> and I was like I was like yo that is the illest shit I have ever fucking heard fun crusher and he was like what <laughs> I was like I was like fun crusher and he was like what are you talking about and I was like it says it right here the ill funk crusher and he was like gun runner it says gun runner <laughs> <laughs> and we and we just burst into fucking laughter and we just fucking and we couldn't stop and it was just like we were just like on the spot we were like that's the album that's funk it crusher. Funk crusher. because we were just like that is the like that is the most we were interested in like how can we be the biggest assholes possible like yeah. how is it how can we in one word be like we're a different breed of fucking asshole here. Like you've never right. met this breed. Like we're so fucked up that we're as a badge of honor going to destroy any joy that you have. <laughs> <laughs> that was kind of part of what our humor was, was we looked for mistakes and, we, and, then, and then we took those mistakes and we incorporated them. Hell, the maladjusted MC fun crusher. And because to some degree, we never really thought anyone was going to be listening to this music. Right. Up. So we just made made each other laugh, you know? 
So, you know, so y'all put together the Funk Crusher. Uh, I don't know if you want to call it the EP, original LP. I'm the not EP. Sure. EP. It, was okay. the first, it started as an EP. Eight songs, but it was an EP. Um, and, you know, earlier you were saying how, like, the idea of, you know, getting a deal was something mythical. And I know you had the situation um, with the homies that that ended up going south. But, like, how did you end up at the, in the position to, like, get a deal for Fun Crusher, get a deal for Company Flow, when that seemed like such a faraway thing? We didn't. After that experience, what happened was I was in a really shitty... I, I didn't read the contract that, that I was under this dude's management, this dude's management contract. And it was one of those classic, like, Bible yeah, contracts. Yeah. And I and I didn't even read that shit. I was just like, "Let's go!" Yeah, and as so many kids do. Mm-hmm. And, then, and then when it fell apart, and I got scared that I was going to be trapped in the thing because they really had me over. It was really classic "fuck you in the ass" contract right. shit, um, and not in the good way, you know. Right. Not in the way that some, you know, like you know. Um, I sought out. I had this. I had this book called um, "This Business of Music." Mm. And it was written by this guy, William Krasilovsky, who had, was like Bruce Springsteen's lawyer and Chuck Berry's lawyer and like Ahmad Jamal's lawyer. And like, he was a famous industry guy who had written this book that was a tome. If you wanted to learn about the music business, which I did, you, that was the book, you know? Mm. And um, I looked him up. I, 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 I looked and saw that he had law offices in New York. And I looked him up. Because I needed to figure out how to get out of the deal. So I, I, I went to his office and said, here's this deal that I'm in. I don't know what I got myself into. If you can help me get out of it, help me get out of it. But whatever you need, I just want to learn. I want to intern here. I want to understand. Because I don't know. I obviously don't fucking get it. I obviously right. don't know anything about how people operate. It was such a shock to me that anyone would even think to like lock a kid down in the contract. I was right. like, and, and I knew that I needed to do this for my life. I knew that I, and so he was like, all right, like, fuck it. You want to work for free for me for filing papers and shit? I'll, I'll take a look at your shit. And, and so that's what happened. I did. And he did get me out. He did get me out of that thing because some crazy thing. It was like, I had signed it when I was a minor or something. Okay. You know? Okay. I had signed the contract when I was a minor. So he was just like, I don't even worry about it. Right. You know? And, um, and there was no co-signature or anything like that. So, you know, he got me out. But because of that, um, and, and I was around him and I got to soak up a little bit of his perspective on mm. this. And it, and, it, and it resonated with me. And because of my experience in the business, I had a healthy disgust at a very young age for the way that artists were treated. Right. Very early. Out of direct experience. And that translated into us making our own songs or whatever and doing our own thing. And then what we thought was, well, we'll just press these records. We'll just press something up. And, and still, we were still in the mindset of maybe then we'll get a deal. Right. And we were pressing the records up. And um, before we did it, we realized, why are we just doing this single? Like, that's what we we're going to do. We we're going to do that A and B side thing. 12 minutes. We'll sh- yeah, two songs. And we were like, but we got eight songs. And I think they might fit on this vinyl. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, and why, yeah. what, what's the, why are we not doing that? You know? Right. And, and, and so we were just like, yeah, fuck it. You know, if we're going to get these shits pressed up, which we had, you know, we had put together some money to press up a small run of these, you know, of some records. We, you know, we had contacted a little indie plant yeah. and, and we had fucking sucked out the number and shit. And we were like, we'll, we'll, we'll put this investment in. You know, we were we were on it. We were like, we're going to invest in ourselves. And we're going to try and get pop. And, and, and um, we just ended up putting all the songs on there. And then we were like, we still went ahead with the plan of sending it out. Now, what the, what the other part of the plan was, is that once we pressed up these couple of hundred records, we were going to send them, and we did, all over the country using the Tower Records mail order. Oh. So we scammed Tower Records mail order. He was in the front with the computers. Right entering the numbers, but, you know, and I was in the back wrapping them up and shipping them out. So everybody across the country, every DJ that we could find, and, and bear in mind, we had a list of DJs because the previous people that we were working with, that's what they did. They sent records to they DJs. They sent faxes. They sent records to DJs. So we had a fucking a Rolodex of fucking uh, names <laughs> and right. what stations that they were at. 
And we sent those records everywhere, day, next day delivery, all over the country, you wow. know, for free. On and, Tower's um, Dime, yeah. On Tower's Dime, yep. Come and get me, boys. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, we started to actually get make some noise. I mean, obviously, Stretch and Bob were playing. They were playing our, first of all, Stretch and Bob were playing the demos that we were making that ended up on that EP. Wow. They were playing them off a of cassette. I had met Bob because he liked that first jam I did. And I went up to there in 1993 to freestyle or whatever. And we clicked. They like, you know, and he was a, he was a supporter right from the jump. That's tight. And, um, so I would see Bob songs as we made them, you know, peep around corners, yeah. you know, fire, which you burn eight steps to perfection. Five of America. These songs, we just, I just fed him and he would we'd sit there, sit yeah. there and listen with a beer and listen and see if they played them. And they started playing them. And our names tight. started ringing out. Our right. names started ringing out on the underground off of these demos. So when we finally put the records together, people unexpectedly to us were actually like looking for the shit already. Ah. And it started to take off and people started ordering them for us. And we started actually pressing more. And by that point, we had started to get a taste of like, wait a second, this is cool. Like we press this shit up and then we sell it and then I get the money and I didn't right. have and, to deal. Right. You get 100% of the money. Like you don't have to deal with no weird right. splits or recoups or none of that shit. No, no, shit, no, no, shit. And, we, and, and I'm like, we were like, and, and and bear in mind at the same time, we're looking at the fucking mainstream music that's going on at that time and being like, it's, I just, that's not what we do. Right. You know what I mean? So why am I, how could I possibly get into that realm? But no one told me that I could do this on my own and actually not have to deal with assholes. Right. You're telling me that we can just do this shit. No one tells us what to make. No one tells us what to do. And we do it on our own time, our own dime, and we get the money back. And all of a sudden, as a young man, as a, you know, 20 year old, a 19 year old, 20 year old, I like have a little money in my pocket. Like I can go like get an apartment or some shit. That's crazy. So that's why we didn't get a deal because we started to get gas on what it was, what was happening. We started to get excited about it. Like, wait a second. Up until that point, it was either you were not in business or you were on a major label and everyone in between had to just be in it for the art and just hope that something magical happened. Right. We were like, wait, there can be something here that is works for our life. That is exciting that, you know, and we started to get into it. That's why the independent fuck thing happened yeah, because yeah, yeah. we were sitting at the fucking kitchen table, cutting out letters and with glue sticks and blah, 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 to like try and like make the labels yeah. that we were going to fucking Xerox and then make the the, tw the 12 inch with. And I literally, this, 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 this is a true story. I literally looked at Jeff and I looked at the pile of garbage on our, on our table. And I looked at us just by ourselves, <laughs> just <laughs> trying to like make a record with our hands. Yeah. And I was like, yo, we're not just independent, man. We're independent as <laughs> and, and we laughed and That's we laughed hard. and we were like yeah we are aren't we and i was like yeah we are actually and i'm putting that right here uh -huh. and i and, and, and we're writing that on this shit Damn. and that's and that's what we did and from that point on we were like yeah fuck a deal right oh yeah. so then what happens so so raucous enters the picture and and i've read of a bidding war uh but i wanted to get your perspective on that like because that's 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 mythical too like in terms of the the, the legendary status of it like i, I want to hear from you like was there a, a bidding war for cold flow not not in the sense that there were like giant bags of money being thrown at us and everyone was trying to compete with each other to get us but the record did well yeah the record did well independently thanks to stretch and bob and thanks to stores like fat beats and yeah. thanks to distributors like um um on the west coast like the one that peanut butter wolf worked at i uh, love it the, um that um, wasn't was access getting... was it or no yeah. um i forget um and thanks to um the, all of a sudden i think that we company flow had the first legitimate selling independent hit of that era um yeah. of, of the new era Mm -hmm. that, that that had gotten nothing but crazy reviews and also was generating real fucking sales. Right. Um, and for us, real sales was, you know, we probably did 180, 100, you know, uh, uh, 
it was real. It was Yo, like that's crazy. Holy. Yeah, that's it was crazy. like holy shit. You know, we were blown away. And this is not immediately, but it was like right. it kept, you, kept you know, up. and the impact that the music was happening was was real. And people were now looking at Company Flow as though it was the thing that was happening at the time in in hip hop music that wasn't commercial. You right. know, um, it was defining for people that there was another scene that there was another idea out there and another thing that could happen. And I think also it was part of not only intellectually and spiritually defining the, the ideals of an independent team, but it was also showing that an independent team could actually be valuable. That the music that was happening with all these amazing talented artists in this team that never really had any outlets, that there was actually a business there. Yeah. 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 And that and that these people didn't have to change who they were in order to right. make money. And that was important. Like, yo, actually, you can be this weird or you can be this aggressive or hard or you can be this interesting. Yeah. You can be this even um unpolished to some degree, but the energy is important and you can actually have a career. Yeah, you don't have to starve because you want to be different than what's happening in the mainstream. Or you are different just yeah. naturally. And, and so after that kind of had an impact, after that EP had an impact, we started to get calls. Mm -hmm. We started to get calls from a lot of different types of labels, from major labels to emerging indie labels, not only on the East Coast, but on the West Coast. And at this point, we were pretty on our own dicks. Because, yeah, yeah, for sure. It's because, because we had done it ourselves. Right. And we were like, what you know i mean i'm talking about like going to record labels and putting my feet up on the desk and smoking a cigar <laughs> like Shit. tell me tell me what the what 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 do you what are you what are you gonna give me you know you know again i was a bit of a you know i was <laughs> a bit of a prick but but, but you but so you, earned, you earned the right to be in, in that situation you earned the right to be i was young and i and, and i had a chip on my shoulder not only just in general as a person but also about the industry yeah and so i wasn't like super open and receptive to meeting with these people. I wasn't really, I had whatever, whatever um, magic in my head about that system that used to be there when I was a kid had basically taken a turn and I had actually different, I had a, the, the a converse opinion about it. I was actually, I actually thought that it was bullshit. Yeah. And um, of course it's always, the truth is always somewhere in the middle, right? And right. not everybody is bullshit, but we went around and we, um, we had these meetings and the old offers started to come in. So I don't know if that makes it a bidding war, but I do know that right. there were, I mean, but that were, is, that is there's people come, there's, you're getting competing offers. People are trying to impress y'all. They, they see what's going on with co-flow and they want to be in the co-flow business. Sure. That did happen. And, um, and one of the labels that one of the last labels that we met with was rockers. Mm -hmm. And at the time, they really didn't have much of a name. They had an office and they had um, records that they had put out, but they didn't have anything that really defined them as a label. It wasn't like a known entity. It wasn't like people were like, oh, shit, you're going to Raucous Records? <laughs> it was like, who's Raucous Records? And that's <laughs> kinda, that was kind of our perspective, too. But they were like, no, these guys actually really want to talk. They're like, they seem like they might be real about this shit. And they're like, all right, fine. It's in New York. We can go talk to these guys. But the thing is, the, the thing about it is one of the things that I forgot to mention is that what we did at that time, instead of, instead of like listening to really what offers were, what, what they wanted to do for us, we were so serious about how we wanted to operate and so okay with not getting a deal. That's like, it was one of those things where we almost, we, make, we tried to make it as hard as possible for anyone to sign. Yeah. Because we were, we were like, we can be a label. So what we did was we outlined a series of deal points ahead of time and we brought them to people. And most of those people, when we held those deal points out, most of it, it was like the Ark of the Covenant being opened and the spaces <laughs> being blown off and shit, you know, like, look away, you know, like, and. And, you know, rightfully so, because we were like, okay, here's the deal. We're going to own the Masters. It's a 50-50 split. It's a one-off deal, and you're going to give us 100 grand up front. This is automatically non-starters, I'm assuming, for a lot of these labels. Non-starters yeah. for mad labels. We have complete creative control. You don't say a fucking word to us about the music. You put out whatever singles we want to put out. 
We have complete control over the art. We have complete control over the advertising. We have complete control over everything that happens in this situation. Get the fuck out of here. Go. <laughs> you know, get out. Scoot. And then, and then, um, to Ruckus's credit, they were presented with the same deal points and they went, that's interesting. Okay. All right. Yeah. We can work wow. with that. Let's do this. And we, and we had backed ourselves in a corner because we had, again, designed this thing to scare away Everybody. because we didn't want to get, we didn't want to get trapped the way. Listen, also, we're the first generation of dudes who knew the horror story. Yeah. Those horror stories about labels and the way that they fuck people over had just started to really come out in the hip hop world and really started to get known as the mythology. So we were also dealing with that. But we had backed ourselves in a corner because we had set a criteria that if, if met, then we couldn't reasonably say no. Right. And so they said yes. And we were like, Oh shit. Uh, okay. Guess we're doing <laughs> a record, to, you know? Yeah. And that's how that happened. So what was the, uh, what was behind the decision to like, okay, so you got this EP that's already, um, out there doing great work for y'all, getting, getting y'all's names known. It's, it's, it's selling units. Now sign this deal with Rockish. What is the thought of kind of repackaging Fun Crusher into a new into a new project rather than just doing all new music for this initial deal? Because it was because for us it was a it was like like we wanted the world to hear this. We knew that we were only right, being exposed okay. to like gotcha. a very small group of people, gotcha. a potent group of people. You know, people who were really into the music, but it was still really small at the time. And we were so happy and, and, and like with the music that we didn't want to just throw it out and start all over again. And we considered this shit an EP. We basically said, this is what we want to do. We want to do an, ex we want to turn this EP into an album. We want to do more songs and we want to flesh it out and we want to make it a bigger, more unified piece. Mm -hmm. And, um, again, these days, eight songs is not exactly an EP, you know, for people. Yeah, it's an um, album. These days. It's an album. But you're talking to guys who, when they made the album, there's 19 songs on it. Right. <laughs> you know, yeah, so, that's true. You had to fill yeah, that whole CD we were, we were like, yeah, you have to write to the very fucking end. Like, we can't do it anymore. It's so <laughs> you know, we like, like, one more song. You know, that's what I think that a lot of young artists do with their first albums. I think that they have been waiting their whole lives to say something and all their ideas are so new and so fresh and they're so enamored with all of them that they want to present them all. And, you know, you don't know if you're ever going to get the shot again, you don't, you know, but you've been waiting for the shot your whole life. And so we just put everything that we had on that motherfucker. And that's, um, really that's why we did it. Because that's why we did that because we were like, well, they were, they were offering things that we did not have the chance to have like a video, mm -hmm. like retail promotion, like radio promotion, like, um, you know, advertising things that, you know, they genuinely brought to the table and they also got something from it because they saw that we were being positioned as being at the center of a movement. Yeah. Company flow had turned into the faces of what the new independent scene was. And we had an ethos that people were connecting with and that were, and that it was affecting people. It was affecting the way that people thought about the scene. So that was an ethos and they didn't have an ethos. They didn't have a thing. They, they could now say independent as well. They could now say that they were a part of that. And they were. I mean, they were a part of that. They took it somewhere. They, they made it actually viable as, as, as like, as, you know, all of a sudden we were in the source. All of a sudden mm -hmm. we were on high 97. All of a sudden, not, not because of any other reason than we were able to get it into people's hands now. Right. They didn't like the shit they wouldn't put in the source. <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't like the right. shit they wouldn't play. But it's not like we were on that payola level, you know. Yeah, it was like this yeah. is an indie label, but it was one that had a staff, and they were and they were hustling, and they were hungry, and they were excited. So it was an exciting era, but it did, in some ways, mark the end of that other era in the sense of that culture that was free in a way because there was no chance at making any money. Right. There was no chance at fucking making any deals. There's something that comes with that that's beautiful, you know. There's right. something that comes with that that um, adds something to the scene that you know I think disappears once business comes into it. Bit, right. Once you know? the stakes are higher, once there's people you have to kind of answer to or include into the process that aren't like creatives themselves necessarily. Yeah. Like well, it, it or or more like once 
once it's a bit. Right. You know what I mean? Because it's like, all right, now I don't really have all the time in the world to just indulge in. Like, I don't have like, you know, there's that magical time when you're young between when you're doing something and when you're not. Mm-hmm. That all that time essentially is yours. Other than that time that you're trying to grind up some shitty job that makes some money. Right. The world is open and you can spend your time freestyling with people in the subway station if you want, which we yeah. did. But it, it, it had, it had this step that company flow took also attracted other people to that label. It attracted, you know, um, you know, Talib Kweli. It attracted most depth. It attracted Sir Menelik. It attracted, you know, it attracted a lot of other people that would fill out the roster. Right. And, and I don't, I don't know if it was the only thing that attracted them, but it definitely had an effect because we yeah. were an artist that people, you know, it's just like me. If I'm if I'm looking to fuck with another label, I'm going to look at their roster. Yeah. You know? I'm, I'm going to see who I want to be associated with. See what they um, represent. Correct. So um, that was um, the beginning of something else. You know, it was the beginning of uh, us being a part of something that I think would be looked at as a model for a new level of indie label. Word. Well, yeah. let's, you know, let's, let's talk about some of the songs a little bit. Um, well, I, I remember hearing um, hearing this album for the first time. Uh, I think it was ninety seven. It came out, uh, and this is in the middle of the kind of underground revolution um, that I'm taking place. I mean, it's taking place, you know, in, in New York, in LA, and and I'm in Chicago, um, where we're doing our own thing. You know, uh, b boy arts, all of that freestyling, tagging up trains. Um, yeah, it was happening everywhere. I mean, yeah. I mean, obviously, we weren't at the weren't the the center of the universe there. It was happening on the west. It was happening in different cities on the east. It was like you know, yeah. But we were here, where you know, where the music was coming from, and every now and then you get a hold of a project, and and this, you know, this was one where you heard it and be like, "Yo, this is like aesthetically, artistically, like the spirit of this is like everything I'm doing right now." But in mm. addition to that, I ain't never heard nothing like this. You know what I'm saying? Like, and I think a lot of that has to do with your production style, mm. which, you know, of course has been, ha- has been lauded and has been talked about, but from your perspective, I, I, if, if you could put it in, in your own terms, like, what do you think makes it different than what other people do? Oh man. Shit. So at the time I was using, uh, an EPS, an Insonic EPS 16 plus keyboard sampler. Mm-hmm. And the way that that's laid out is different than a drum machine mm-hmm. in the sense that, and this is just, this is the technical maybe. This is maybe one thing that lends itself to a technical a- aspect of it that made things different because it leads you to thinking about the way that you put stuff together differently. Uh-huh. You have things on keys as opposed to pads, you're tempted to start playing them like keys. Yeah. So when you have notes and things or samples, it could be a horn. All of a sudden, why wouldn't you play? Why couldn't that be the baseline? Right. You know what I mean, I just think that there's a different construction that made the the technical um, intricacies of that thing just sounded different than I think what a lot of people were using in general. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, a lot of people were using drum machines and shit. Um, but I think that also one of the one of the one of the things for me that maybe was simply influence, you know? Mm. Not in terms of influence. We're all influenced by the same rap music. We're all influenced by the same rap records. But I don't think that we were all influenced by the same other shit. Rock records, uh, other genres in general. And the shit that I had that I listened to in my record collection that I could, in the dollar bin, pick up or whatever, mm-hmm. I was attracted to different stuff. It wasn't of the ilk of what, was, what most people were thinking about sampling at the time for rap records right. um for records at all i was trying to loop up noises and mm. and and i was i was attracted to to jagged first of all i'm a, I'm a child of influence from run dmc stetsasonic ultra mag um uh, but also just as much it was like art of noise yeah it was like devo mm-hmm. um it was um prince but also a lot of film shit, a lot of, a lot of I, like from a very young age was really in the film shit or I'd hear something and I'd try and find the soundtrack and just, but just like, I wanted to have something that just fucking 
just jaggedly fucking like you know uppercutting so not all the time sometimes it was a bop but sometimes i think some of the shit that i was doing that other people weren't doing it it had a um a jaggedness to it yeah. that i in my head could rock over yeah, you know what yeah, i mean yeah, like yeah. it like and i don't i just don't think that that many people were thinking about that type of sound to rock over like that type of spirit of sound you know yeah, yeah, yeah. um but I had to, I had run DMC in my blood, so it was stabs. It was it was yeah. shit that started but stopped again. It was things that it, just like our language and how we could put our language together to say fucked up shit without even cursing. It was just you know putting the word sound um, next to crush. Yes, is, is fucked up. It feels it's like got, it's got the spirit of a curse word, even though it's not yeah. exactly. So I think as I was trying to find my, my find my footing. For me, I, I was attracted to mistakes. Like I was attracted to things that didn't work perfectly. Because I thought it was ill if you could rock over something that didn't that that wasn't smooth, right. that wasn't perfectly aligned, that wasn't going to have the same that it that that had to kind of wake you up a little bit. You know, um, it inspired me as a as a rapper, but also it had to have those drums. It had to have that bop and all my drums and all that shit. I wasn't using at the time when I came out, everyone was very jazz influenced. Everyone was very soul influenced, but I was using really big drums, yeah. you know, real, like shit that because I came from the era of, I came from sucker MCs. So I, you know, and of course I, I think that also, like I said, with, with, with even with being a rapper, it's like, you think that you're making some shit that makes sense to everybody. Right. And then you play it to them and they're like, that's crazy. You know? <laughs> And you're like really like <laughs> like and then you know and then you start to realize like uh, i might be crazy like i actually right. might be crazy slowly you start to accept that shit like eh, yeah i guess i'm just fucking <laughs> weird because i hear this shit and it sounds normal to me you know what i mean but it's it, it matches up in my head with with what's exciting about music and um yeah well i mean you know well, it certainly seems to have worked out <laughs> Stony Island Audio.